Hello, I'm Steve Davis and welcome to the story of snooker. For years, snooker remained the poor relation of the much more popular game of billiards. But billiards died a slow death. Snooker, though, was saved by technology. It was colour television that transformed the game. Now the audience could actually see what the players were trying to do. And so began the second life of snooker. Very quickly, players were winning previously unheard of amounts of money and becoming household names. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. No history of the game can fail to mention its first legend, the man who set the standard for the rest of us to beat. And here to tell you about him is the voice of snooker, Clive Everton. If it hadn't been for Joe Davis, snooker as we know it today would most likely not exist. He was the game's life and soul and its guardian angel during the many years that it struggled to imprint itself on the nation's consciousness. Like so many of the early snooker players, Joe was initially a billiards player. In 1928, he became world champion. But it was the very excellence of players like Joe and the Australian Walter Lindrum that effectively finished billiards as a spectator sport. These players had perfected the game to the point where breaks could go on forever, or what to the audience could seem like forever. That's how to make a hundred break. I see, Walter. And how do you make a thousand break? Just make nine more hundreds. The public wanted something more competitive, more dramatic. Joe directed his energies into developing snooker from its very small beginnings. Joe Davis's skill and vision transformed snooker from a fairly crude potting contest into a tactically complex game in which break building and safety play became crucial to a player's success. In the process, he became snooker's first world champion, a championship he himself had instigated in 1926. Joe Davis, 13 times holder of the World Professional Snooker title, is playing his younger brother and pupil, Fred, at Thurston's. The spectacle Fred puts up a spirited fight, but the champion is at the top of his form. He held the title unbeaten for 20 years, until he retired from World Championship play in 1946. The official line was that he was giving others a chance. The reality was that he wanted to retire undefeated and his younger brother Fred was a distinct threat. Fred next month is due to register for the army, so that might keep him quiet for a while. <laughs> Whose pretty grip always goes so well with the beautiful bridge. Both Joe's influence in the early development of the game extended well beyond the table. His word was law. Joe will now entertain you with a demonstration game of snooker. Watch it carefully and observe how he leaves the cue ball in position. He was chairman of the Professional Players Association and a co-leaseholder of Leicester Square Hall, the home of professional snooker for 20 years after the war. But for most professional snooker players, like John Pullman coaching here at Butlins, life wasn't easy. Money came mainly from club exhibitions. In fact, between 1957 and 1964, there were so few professionals and so little public interest that the World Championship wasn't even staged. And so Pop Black came to pass. 
a 15-week series of one-frame matches. Players regarded results as immaterial, but their faces became familiar to the general public. Very quickly, Pop Black became BBC Two's second highest rating show. Snooker was on its way to becoming a major television attraction. One young man was watching these new sporting heroes on television with a special interest. When I started to take an interest in the game, there were two players who were sweeping all before them. Between them, they would win the World Championship nine times. One was a former police constable from Wales with more than a passing resemblance to Bela Lugosi, and the other revolutionised the game with his long potting and his dramatic use of the screw shot. Reardon was a crowd favourite for his repartee and his personality, as well as his skill. He won his first world title, untelevised, in 1970, his second in 1973. He wants the rest for the blue and he's then got a chance of clearing the table. Now he's going for the green for his uh, position on the yellow. 64. Perfect position. <laughs> Not quite hard enough for back for the green is the ball. He must now part and then the brown. Joe Davis there, very intent as Reardon makes this lovely break. 69. Brown is followed by the blue. 73. Taking it up into the top pocket. It's a lovely shot. He's left himself a, a double on the pink, which is not an easy one. It's an acute angle. A great shot. Great shot. Great performance here by uh, Redden. Obviously increasing his lead to three frames. A lovely break there. 7-0 down to Australia's Eddie Charlton after the opening session of their five-day final, Reardon recovered to win 38-32. First frame of the last day's play, 98 points to Charlton's 18, and so increase his lead now to, to retain the title in 1974 and 75. 24 frames to 21. The magic 25, surely soon to go up on the scoreboard there above the name of John Spencer. Spencer won the title twice in his first three attempts and for a third time in 1977, beating Canada's Cliff Thorburn in the final of the first championship to be staged at Sheffield's There's Crucible the Theatre. The pink over the centre. Remarkably, Spencer used a cue he'd had only for two months, much against the received wisdom that it took years to become accustomed to a new cue. One. Now he's looking at the black. Secondly, the cue was a two-piece, formerly seen as far less reliable than a one-piece and suitable only for pool. Terrific amount of check side there on the cue ball. Seven. Not an easy Not one Spencer. by any matter of means. And Spencer quite content to put another. And in fact, uh, Cliff Thorburn 
the great sportsman he is, has conceded that our 46th frame, and it is after 46 frames out of the 49 of this World Snooker Championship final that John Spencer takes the world crown for the third time. John Spencer receiving from John Goodchuck his cheque for £6,000 and now... As Spencer lifted the trophy, it was obvious that the championship had found a new spiritual home, its own Wimbledon. Its stage, its auditorium, produced an intense atmosphere all its own. It also had a sponsor, Embassy, who were to stay with it for 25 years as the champion's prize rose to a quarter of a million pounds. The game was truly on the up. Nineteen seventy eight was a key year in the story of snooker. The BBC's decision to cover the championship from first ball to last proved that the public was prepared to watch snooker for hours at a time, following their own favourites and watching plots and subplots develop over several days. Ray Reardon became champion for the sixth time by beating the South African left-hander Perry Mons in the final, but the star of the show was Fred Davis, who reached the semi-finals at the age of 64. And the progress was checked right through the semi-final by the greatest of them all, his elder brother, Joe Davis. Oh yes, this young brother of mine, yes, yes. Well, I think he's got a new lease of life from somewhere. And he's played a double. The semi-final between Davis and Mons provided not only the most dramatic match of the championship, but off-table, a tragedy. <laughs> Joe was taken ill during the mid-session interval of the final session. He'd been swinging this way and that in his seat, living every shot with his brother. It was too much for him. And he's... Oh. Well, what an extraordinary shot. He collapsed, survived a heart operation, but died in convalescence a few weeks later. Fred Davis then, 11 points in front. Is he really Fred looking Davis. to the heavens? <laughs> All on the black. If there was any consolation, it was that the game's first legend had at least lived long enough to see the championship become an accepted highlight of the British sporting calendar. Snooker had taken off as a television sport. Sponsors wanted television exposure, more amateurs turned professional wanting their slice of the new money on offer. Terry Griffiths had worked in Flanethley as a blacksmith's assistant, a bus conductor, a postman and an insurance salesman. In his first year as a professional, he became world champion, beating Alex Higgins 13-12 in the quarterfinals and Eddie Charlton 1917 in an epic semi-final which finished at 20-2 in the morning. Well, that brings... Terry Griffiths, 27 points in front, with a mere 22 points left on the table. And Eddie surely must now feel that the sends a time of run out. A dejected Australian champion. Griffiths adding up the scores. He can't work it out. 27 points in front and four colours to go, totalling 22 points. His first entry into the championship, having won two matches in the qualifying, firstly beating Bernard Bennett and then Jim Medicroft. In the first round, 
he defeated us South African champion Perry Mons a battle on the 25th frame taking Alex Higgins and now to the roar of the audience Terry Jeffis defeats the Australian champion to go through into the embassy final at his first attempt I'm in the final now, you know. Terry. <laughs> the final wasn't so dramatic. Griffiths beat Dennis Taylor 24-16 for the title to put a new name on the trophy after a decade of three-way dominance. Six titles for Ray Reardon, three for John Spencer, one for Alex Higgins. A deep screw with a lot of side, but it's not quite hard enough. And Griffiths snippers himself on the first of the six colours, the yellow. He's not bothered about that now. Quite happy in his mind that he is to pick up the world crown, the trophy, and the first prize of £10,000. The highest break of the championships goes to Canadian champion Phil Werbenick who had a magnificent 142. And Dennis Taylor concedes. If there was one undisputed genius of the game in its early television era, it was Alex Higgins. Even though he only won the World Championship twice, until the arrival of Ronnie O'Sullivan, he was perhaps the most naturally gifted player to ever pick up a cue. He was fearless and outrageous, both on and off the table, but as so often with genius, it came with a high price. This Belfast boy learned his trade in a down-at-heel snooker club called the Jam Pot. It helped him acquire a sharp competitive edge to go with the quick instinctive brilliance which led to him being called the Hurricane. The snooker world had known about him for two or three years when he first came to the notice of the general public by beating John Spencer, the defending champion, to win the world title at his first attempt in 1972. Sadly, not a ball of this was televised. He won a grand total of £480, minus his £100 entry fee. Well, I, actually, at this moment, I think I'm in a bit of a daze. Although I think I'm just starting to come out of it, you know, and realise that I'm uh, the world champion. He was Snooker's first superstar of the modern era. He put it on the sports pages and at times onto the news pages, partly through his skill, speed and charisma, but also through his colourful off-table life. Emotional intensity and the threat of danger hung around him. This snooker player was news and the press lapped up his exploits. Only intermittently though did Higgins sustain the inspiration which had carried him to the 1972 world title. Reardon and Spencer were too consistent for him on the whole. Reardon demoralised him in his second world final in 1976 beating him comfortably 27-16. This read very steadily into the centre. He plays it very steadily, but it's still on the table. And he's missed it. Now what's he done? He has conceded. In 1980, Higgins lost in the final again to the grinder, Cliff Thorburn, partly because he started playing to the gallery when he was four frames in front. Cool, resolute, consistent, Thorburn overhauled him to win 18-16 and become the Crucible's first overseas champion. Defeated by John Spencer in 1977, has fought his battles through Doug Mountjoy, Jim Weich, 
David Taylor, and now finally, the unpredictable Alex Hurricane Higgins to take the Embassy oh, World Snooker Championship title, 1980. But uh, I must say that um, it's very difficult uh, uh, to play in front of Alex Higgins' uh, home crowd. It's the same thing when Alex comes over to Canada. You're a fantastic audience, and I just hope that uh, you stick with him because he's the biggest draw in the game of snooker today. Alex, a tribute from a champion there, and you know what the crowd think about it, but you must at the moment be the most disappointed man in the world. I've had disappointments before, but I'll bounce back. The thing is, I lost the match, really, uh, the third session, when I was 7-3 in front. Uh, my old crowd pleasing bit came back again. Yes. Uh, but uh, it's hard to live with, but I mean, I, I do, but I'll bounce. In 1982, Jimmy White was two up with three to play against Higgins in their world semi-final. Higgins' 69 clearance to win the penultimate frame on the black is still the most famous and most breathtaking match-saving clearance in the history of the game. You get the feeling, Jack, this could be the winning break. 13. 13. And that really is a delightful shot to get around the angles, getting on the right side of all the reds. So Alex breathes again. 59 points in front now. And still enough points on the table for Alex, if he can just take his opportunity. Well, what would you do here, John? Well, I think he's got to have a go at the blue or the green. Um, there's plenty of points on the table for Alex. With that shot has brought the only red that was relatively safe over the centre pocket. And at the moment Alex just isn't getting the run. He's he had it in the early stages, but it's left him at the moment. Well, he can pot this blackjack, and I think he's got to go for it into this right-hand corner pocket. This is the big shot of the frame. And that's a tremendous shot under pressure. A lot of courage Alex has got. Twelve. And now another difficult red into the centre pocket.
And Alex not able to afford any mistakes. If he's going to go for a colour to play for the Reds, he must get it, or else it could be the end of the match. Well, it's not an easy position, this. He might elect to play a safe. Looks as if he's going for the blue into the top right-hand corner. And then another tremendous shot. into the corner pocket, right hand bottom pocket. Oh, and that's a beautiful shot. Two behind. Red in the middle. Thirty-four. I'm feeling nervous for him, Jack. I think if he clears this, this would be the break of the tournament. Here we have the colours on their spots. Yes, Jack, all easy shots these normally, but every one a pressure shot in this situation. <laughs> 14 behind. Just has to hold it together for five more shots. Tremendous break, this. Beautifully on the pink. And he needs the pink and the black. And he's on the black. And what a fabulous break if he knocks this black in. Oh, marvellous! With White demoralised, Higgins took the decider to win 16-15. And in a gripping final against Ray Reardon, he produced a devastating closing burst to prevail 18-15. Snooker century of the championship. And what a time to make it, Ted. Fantastic. Nate. 
Quiet, please. Thank you. Just three balls to go now for a break of a hundred and thirty five. Ray Reardon has sat in his chair for the whole of this final frame. Fantastic. Embassy World Snooker Champion for 1982 is Alex Hurricane Higgins. Completely exhausted is Higgins. Standing ovation throughout the thousand people here at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Alex Hurricane Higgins, after 10 years, has regained the title of World Snooker Champion. Ladies and gentlemen. And admirers all the way round, the fans coming forward, congratulations from every side for this extraordinary young Irishman who has done so much for the world of snooker since he came on the scene just 10 years ago. He sits in his seat, he stands up. He is completely exhausted, but he is the Embassy World Champion 1982. Ladies and gentlemen, please, we have the presentation now. Alex waiting now. He went straight to Ray Reardon, put his head on his shoulder, knowing that he had taken a crown that Ray had held on six occasions. These scenes are for many people the most enduring image of Alex Higgins, but sadly, inevitably, the euphoria of this moment didn't last. His own roller coaster life plunged and soared on and off the table. His spells of brilliance became fewer and further between as the years went by. His verbal and physical aggression, his long list of disciplinary offences, commanded more headlines than his performances on the table. At the 1990 championship, he cut a sorry figure. Sliding down the rankings, he'd lost all his money, much of it in a disastrous management entanglement. He was divorced, a new relationship had broken up, and he was facing serious disciplinary action. Beaten by Steve James in the first round, he sat alone in the Crucible Auditorium long after the lights over his table had been switched off.
Moments later, he punched an official backstage and followed up with a rambling critique of how the game was run. You can shove your snooker up your jacket. I am not playing no more. I won't be raising a queue again. I've had uh, all sorts of thrown at me by the media over the last six, seven years. Uh, I was supposed to be the stalwart of the game. The guy that took all the brunt, or the kid that took all the brunt, is absolutely sick. But to uh, hear and further about taking all the sh and I'm not prepared to take it any longer. It's interrupting my private life, my children's life, um, a few relationships, and, um, well, let's see how I would do without me, because I ain't planning on Good night, boys. Alex, is there no chance of you reconsidering this video? No, 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 no. Within this diatribe, there was the odd nugget of truth but one way or another, he'd effectively said goodbye to anything but bit parts in tournament snooker. Anyone who saw Alex Higgins as the tempestuous star, or the free spirit that couldn't be controlled, or simply as the self-destructive genius who threw his talent away, would probably also recognise his polar opposite. Steve Davis, with a relentless formula based on immaculate shot selection, heavy break building and outstanding safety play, would become a winning machine. The 1980s would belong to him. The first tournament I won was the, the Coral UK Championship in 1980. I'd been a professional for just over two years. Everybody was saying that I was tip for the top, but until it happens, you never know. You never know if you're going to be a winner or not. There's absolutely no way you can prove to yourself until it happens. I think he's got the perfect angle. He annihilated the 1979 world champion Terry Griffiths 9-0 in the, the semi-finals right to set up a meeting with Higgins in the final. And I think perhaps my moment of realisation happened after I won my quarter-final match. I can't remember who it was against. And before my semi-final, I was preparing for the match and I was lying in the bath and it actually dawned on me, quite a significant moment, that, that I could actually win this. Not just compete and, and do myself justice, as I'd done for the previous two years, but I could actually win it. And that there wasn't really anything to stop me from winning it. Um, and it wasn't so much a case of me thinking I was better than the players I was playing against, because I beat Alex Higgins in the final, one of my heroes in many ways, and a player I was frightened of playing because of his genius qualities. three points ahead. But I just sensed that I was perhaps capable of winning. And perhaps I was re relaxed enough that that was the case. From Plumstead, Steve Davis, making his debut in a big-time championship. The first time he's appeared in a final is about to don the crown of UK champion. I'm sure as the years go by, you will see him as I hope to where the world crowd. And there he is with a big smile. Congratulated by Alex Higgins. Our crowded audience thrilled with this 23-year-old Londoner who has fought his way through from the first round of this UK Championship right the way through defeating several champions on the way, and finally taking victory over Alex Hurricane Higgins at 16 frames to six. I'd won the UK Championship in 1980, um, which was in the same season as winning the World Championship in 81. By that time I'd jumped up a standard that I was walking to the table with so much confidence, um, arrogance in it, it included, that people started to be frightened of me and frightened of that momentum and the weight behind that I carried. And so uh, it was sort of as if it was natural, a progression, looking back at the time, obviously, just marvellous moment. Can he slam this blue into the top pocket? He led Doug Mountjoy 6 0 in the final and beat him 18 12. He's breathing heavily as he comes down to this final pink. And that's it. The World Snooker Champion 1981 
Steve Davis. Davis was deeply satisfied. His manager, Barry Hearn, was ecstatic. From his manager, Barry Hearn. If we can keep centering it up so strongly on... Whilst Davis continued to do the business on the table, Hearn did the business off it in a way that no snooker manager had ever done it before. Exhibitions, sponsorships, promotional contracts, equipment contracts were all set up. The good times were rolling and so was the cash. When I started playing snooker I was just sort of shy, quite introverted. Obviously very good with the snooker cue in my hand but not much else. And it's always nice to have somebody on your side. And Barry was the complete opposite. He was loud and brash and full of confidence and talked things up. He was a natural salesman. And he was selling me to the public in a way. He acted the part of, in a way like an older brother, but more like a friend who, who was always on your side. So for that reason, um, he, he sort of defended or deflected a lot of uh, the attention onto his own shoulders. Let me just play snooker. And I responded. And um, he obviously sold me as a commodity off the table, talked me up, sold me. And the story got bigger and bigger. And obviously the reputation got bigger and bigger as well. And I backed it up with winning on the table. The holy grail for any snooker player is, of course, the world championship title. But there is another route to glory, and that is making a maximum break, a 147. Those that have done it, especially on TV, have guaranteed in a single frame their legendary status. The first 147 with television cameras present was made by John Spencer in the Holston tournament at Slough in 1979. Unfortunately, the cameraman had been given a meal break so Spencer's maximum, snooker's equivalent to the first four-minute mile, wasn't recorded. All the more galling for Spencer then, that he was in the non-striker's chair when Steve Davis made the first televised maximum in the Larder Classic in 1982. Making a 147 break is not something you can plan for, it just happens. And, and mine certainly was the case. I'd just been for a round-the-world trip with Barry Hearn, We'd visited Australia and then Las Vegas, pretending to spread the gospel of snooker and try and get snooker events out there. Actually, we had a holiday. Great fun, enjoyed it. Played a bit of snooker, a couple of exhibitions. I flew back into Heathrow, went straight up to Oldham, in a taxi, I think, and it was snowing in Oldham, and um, I had total jet lag. I didn't know where I was, didn't know what continent I was, I was in. And played the first four frames against John Spencer, 2-2 two -two at the interval shown nothing remarkable whatsoever. I was nearly falling asleep in the, in the interval, in the dressing room, and I went out and John Spencer broke off. The ball went badly, didn't really get the white ball down the under, other end of the table, and I potted a good red in the middle pocket, and I was just off and running. And to this day, I don't know whether it was because I was so tired that when it got to the last few balls, I wasn't as nervous as I would have been or would have expected to have been. Just come off the cushion for black. 89. Well, a little bit straight on that. You'll have to see a, a bit of a deep screw here. And this is a young man who's flown around the world in the last few days. Red right into the middle. Again. 96. Good angle to screw back for the black. Ninety-seven. And once again, a little bit straight. Bit disappointed there. But only two more reds to go. I don't think he's got the angle to get on the black. We'll play a deep screw, I would think. And that's fair enough. 105. What a magnificent break this is. This is very exciting. 95. And there's a confident shot for you. 
leaving himself well down the table, but a nice straight red. One of his favourite shots, stunned this in. What a marvel, this is it now. Pop this in. Beautiful shot, beautiful shot. Perfect angle. And the, the atmosphere is absolutely electric in there now. Well, as if this young man hasn't made enough history in the last 12 months. After potting the last black and then knocking in a long last red, I then realised I was on the brink of doing something very special in the game, the first televised 147 break. I potted a very good black, came down the table for the yellow ideally placed, and then proceeded to make a bit of a pig's ear of it. The first legitimate 147 break ever to be made on television. 122. All the colours on the spots. 125. Come on, come on round. 129. Let's a bit further. But just about scrambled up to get the blue in the pocket. Yeah. And I came very badly on the pink ball and uh, I had to get the rest out and uh, wasn't really guaranteed to pop the pink or to get position on the black. Um, managed to sneak the pink in, of course the crowd were going mad. It really was an exciting moment to be around the snooker world. And he's playing this with a lot of screw to stay on the black. Come on, get in. Fabulous shot. Fabulous shot. And this is it. The first 147 break on television. 140. Well, I'm shaking. And they were probably sensing that something special was going to happen. And as I say, I had the momentum on my side. I was world champion and things were going right for me. And I wasn't ideally placed on the black either. But, you know, fate, I think, played its part. And there was no way I was going to miss it. And um, all of a sudden it went in and I realised I was just... Well, uh, not just world champion, but the first player ever to make a 147 break on television and uh, more acclaim, and uh, it was marvellous. And I'll bet, Quiet, I'll bet this Steve at this moment can see the pocket closing up and closing up and Come getting on, Steve. smaller. Not He's got a standing ovation for that, and rightly so. Absolutely incredible break. Returning to the Crucible as champion in 1982, Davis was in for a shock as he became a victim of the so-called Crucible curse on first-time champions. In reality, he was burnt out from too hectic a schedule. He lost 10-1 in the first round to Tony Knowles. And perfectly on the blue and fourteen. And a little wave of the hand indicates that the Embassy World Champion has been defeated by Tony Knowles in a superb exhibition of match snooker. Normal service was resumed the following year when Davis comfortably overcame the challenge of an exhausted Cliff Thorburn. Thorburn was three times taken the full distance on his way to the final. His 13-12 win over Terry Griffiths included the first 147 maximum in the history of the championship. He hasn't come quite far enough. He's left himself. A tough shot, but that's 15 reds and 15 blacks that he's taken now. Well, 
that was a marvellous yellow that uh, Cliff Thorburn took then. Perfect. Well, I don't think there's going to be another moment in Cliff's life when he's going to be so tense as this. Losing the first four frames yesterday, Stevens battled back to within an ace of the semi-final. As it is, the Cliff Forburn grinding company is still in business. Its proprietor has beaten his fellow Canadian, Kurt Stevens, 13 frames to 12 after a most memorable and dramatic match here at the Crucible. In the semi-finals, Forbin was again up against it. He had to win the last three frames to get past Tony Knowles. This was the climax to the decider. Wriggled in the jaw, gone straight across. What? Poor Tony. And the old maestro wipes his hands and settles down again. That is a blow. To four, he beat Terry Griffiths. At 2.15, he beat Kirk Stevens. I wonder what he's going to do at five past one in the morning.
Oh, and he only wants the brown to go safe. And that was some pot, believe me. So 20 points the lead, 18 on the table, Tony Knowles requiring a snooker. And it does seem that this man has done it again. And not deciding to take any risks, just pushes the blue down the table. mistake there by Tony and if Cliff can cut this blue in that is surely it and that is it and the courage the grit the dedication you name it this man's got it. And Cliff Corbin is in the final in a most memorable semi-final. He's beaten Tony Knowles, maybe with a little bit of luck, but who can deny him that with the, the majestic performances that he's put up through the championship? A truly remarkable snooker player. He had nothing left for the final against Davis, who trounced him with a session to spare, 18-6. It's all over. Steve Davis then continues his tapestry of titles by becoming Embassy World Snooker Champion of 1983. The 1984 World Final was altogether tighter. This time, Davis's opponent was Jimmy White. Davis led 12-4 at the end of the first day's play. The second day was a different story as White came after him. Obviously a moment that sticks in my mind was playing Jimmy White in the, in the World Championship final. I beat him 18-16, but I was 12-4 in front overnight. And Jimmy staged a remarkable comeback. And uh, I more or less fell over the line, but it could have been even closer. It could have gone to a final frame, I'm sure. Jimmy White was a prodigy. He'd been the youngest ever world amateur champion in 1980. He potted like a demon and had a natural verve and flair. Like Alex Higgins, he was to become the people's favourite, although he was never, despite reaching six finals, to be world champion. back to his chair. a long, long way away from that one. 
Yes, he got rather impatient there. And this is probably the best chance Steve's going to have. Not an easy green, but should he get it, must finish on the brown. Jimmy sees the championship now drifting away from him. Quiet, please. Great champion, he is achieving what nobody else has done before. A great performance then by Steve Davis, defending his title and winning it for a second time here at the Crucible Theatre to win the Embassy World Snooker Championship 1984. The 1985 World Final was a high watermark in the history of snooker. Its climax, the deciding frame of 35, remains the most memorable in the history of the game. The worst place that uh, Steve can finish is straight on the green. It set television records. It was the largest British television audience for a sporting event, the largest BBC Two audience ever recorded, and the largest British after midnight audience. This was the unbearably tense conclusion to the 68 minute deciding frame. Amazingly enough, he's uh, got a snooker from that. In fact, he, he avoided the pot on the green in choice and preference to the snooker, hoping to rattle the green in the jaws and leave the white ball behind the pink. Under the circumstances, that's not finished out too bad. as the cocked hat shot. Eighteen points in it, twenty two points on the table. This frame now been going fifty five minutes the longest frame of the final. In another three minutes, it'll be the longest frame of the whole championship.
Dennis had a go. Very tense moments here now at the Crucible Theatre. players under a great strain. <laughs> Having a breathing exercise. Moving the black just might help Dennis. He wants the four balls. It's the shot that Dennis is faced with. I don't think there's any way that he'll play the pot. to the longest frame of the championship. This, of course, the final frame of the championship, the final frame of the final. <coughs> and still we don't know the result. to go for the pot, he only wanted the one ball.
crucible now erupting. Could we just quiet down, please? <coughs> Thank you. The final frame, the final black. <laughs> that really quite incredible as Dennis Taylor goes to the World Trophy and prays to it. What do you do with this one, Dennis? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Certainly going through his mind that he turned the light to play the double. I have never known an atmosphere like this. John Williams, our referee, trying to keep the crowd in order. A good one. I'm sure Dennis wouldn't mind my saying he chanced his arm and it's come out lucky. The defending world champion Steve Davis looks hard at that back. That was the biggest shot of his life. Thank you, ladies 
gentlemen. No. This is really unbelievable. here at the Crucible erupting for this very popular Irishman. He is so happy. Two major titles this season and also the Irish Championship. A fabulous picture of a very happy and popular man. Dennis Taylor, snooker champion of the world. What did you say? I'll tell you what. It's a good job the black was over the pocket. <laughs> but, uh, well, I don't know, that's definitely, well, the greatest match I've ever been involved in in my life. Can I bring in the man who created the match with you, Steve Davis? Steve, it's a, a pretty tough moment, this one, isn't it? Yes. Can you believe what's happened here tonight yet? Yeah, it happened in black and white. <laughs> but actual memories of, of characters uh, within the game at the Crucible, you'd be hard pushed not to, to actually put Joe Johnson up there as the most unlikely winner of the World Championship and also the most chari charismatic in many ways. He played Cavalier Snooker. I'd, I'd lost to Dennis Taylor the previous year and was expected to sort of wipe the floor with Joe Johnson in the, in the final. I was supposed to have done all the hard work to get there, and Joe had had the miracle and got to the final, and he was expected to be the person that everybody said, well, well done, Joe, but, you know, you did really well, but that's, that's as far as you're going to go. But Joe Johnson would be playing marvellous attacking snooker. He didn't change his game at all, and he just totally outplayed me. Six. And Joe will be, I'm sure, thinking now, all I've got to do is hold myself together and the championship's mine. Seven. <coughs> There's enough reds all round the centre of the table. Thirteen. Obviously too straight on the red in the middle, but would want to be the other side of the blue. 
14. Right back in position. <coughs> Twenty. And he'll certainly never have a better chance than this of becoming world champion. Fifteen points in front. And Steve must be becoming resigned now to uh, becoming runner-up for the second year running. What a tournament to win for your first one, the World Championship. And Joe, quite rightly, not rushing at all this break. You can obviously see this is the one. Twenty-seven. <laughs> By taking the green there, of course, it means he needs... Sorry. He needs both reds, red in a colour and the last red, to clinch this Vital 31. frame. Thirty-seven. Just seventeen days ago, he was a rank outsider. And from having the devastation the year before, where my whole world effectively seemed to collapse, my snooker world collapsed around me, of having Dennis beating me in the final frame and having all eyes on it, I then was the loser the next year, but in a totally different uh, way. I, I felt as if Joe had totally outplayed me, and I had no gripes, nothing to complain about. I hadn't thrown it away, and Joe was the rightful world champion. <laughs> Steve, just waiting in his chair, I'm oh. sure, to... The brilliant putting of this fella from Bradford. Nothing to stop him now. The cue ball, not quite. It must be said, he's had the run of the balls, but it takes nothing away from his brilliant putting. And still thoroughly enjoying every moment of it. The crowd here at the Crucible are going mad for Bradford's Joe Johnson. The most remarkable world final I've ever seen. And Joe Johnson defeats Steve Davis, 18 frames to 12 as the capacity crowd go completely mad. I mean, he came back the next year after having had an awful se season, not getting to the final stages of anything, not getting past the first round, it seemed. And everybody said, well, Joe Johnson, one hit wonder. You know, he, he won't get past the first round. What did he do? He got to the final the next year. Absolutely astonishing. Fortunately for me this year, th th that year, the things had changed a bit and I, I sort of had the mental resolve to beat him second time around. Perhaps it was too hard a job for Joe to, to do it twice on the trot, but it certainly wasn't lightning uh, striking just the once because he nearly struck twice. 
78. down at 78 but Joe Johnson the defending champion is the first to come out and congratulate Steve Davis Davis added his fifth world title in 1988 beating Terry Griffiths in the final already had two centuries this evening Still concentrating, but it's all over for the fifth time. Steve Davis becomes world champion. In the sixth in 1989, trouncing John Parrott 18 3. It seemed inconceivable at the time that the John age of Steve was drawing to a close and that the age of Stephen was about to begin. <laughs> 